Hi there. My name is Philip D and I work in the Faculty of HLS Academic Development Department, or the ADD, which was previously known as the PDD, the Personal Development Department. Now, this is the final instalment in a five video series covering key concepts of quantitative systematic reviews. So far in this video series, in video one, I covered broadly the different aspects of a systematic review. Then video two offered a deep dive into a systematic review via an actual published paper. Videos three and four covered the sorts of statistics you will come across, firstly in primary research papers and secondly in an actual systematic review. In this video, I'll give an actual demonstration of running a piece of software, i.e. RevBan, to carry out a meta-analysis, as well as various checks that you would carry out on your own collected and combined data. So on with the video. Using the free to download software RevMan, we will create a forest plot and study and further analyze the results. The intention here is that you work along as I do, pausing the video where necessary at each step to try and mimic what I am doing. So here's the intended plan. If you do not yet have RevMan on your laptop or PC or Mac, then we will need to be able to find and install it. Then, once installed, we can open a new data file, start inputting some data, and this part takes a long time, by the way, and then we can run several meta-analyses as required, creating forest plots, looking at things like the heterogeneity and, if needed, carrying out further tests, such as sensitivity tests, or a subgroup analysis. So first things first, let's find and download RevMan. You can find it by clicking on the link if you access the slides to this presentation, or more simply, just Google the term RevMan, and this page should pretty much come out on top of the list. Then there are two versions of RevMan. There's the online version for which you'll need to set up an account. I haven't done this, so I'm guessing it's still free, but you'll have to check if you want to explore this. But the downloadable version, however, is definitely free. You'll just have to tick the box that says for academic use and fill in a few fields. Let me show you what I mean. OK, so here's Google. I'll just type in RevMan. And there we go. The very top one, RevMan Cochrane Training. It's housed by the Cochrane Library. So I'll click on that link, and here's the relevant page on the Cochrane Library. It tells us there are two versions, online and the desktop version. I'm going to go with the desktop version because I don't have login details. Um, let me find the download. Okay, it says, it reminds us that the very latest version is Redman 5.4.1. Not sure I've got that one more up-to-date one, but I'm going to click on the download button here. It uh, reminds us it's free of charge. If we use it commercially, which we're not, we'd have to purchase a license, so we don't have to. Um, I'm clicking on for academic use because that is what myself and you guys will be doing when you're doing your PhD, sorry, your MSc meta-analysis. Click Submit, and then fill in a few things. So name, job role, academic affiliation, so you might put MSc student. Put in your BCU address because they're going to, more than likely uh, ask for some ratification. Um, what you want to do with uh, the work you expect to do with RevMan, there you'll say complete your MSc. And I'm hoping you're ambitious enough to say with the possibility of publishing the systematic review. Then you tick the agreement box. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Ignore all of them because I don't want any um, uh, annoying emails and then click submit. And I've not been to the next page, but presumably that the next page is, is the download. OK, so finding RevMan was very, very straightforward. And hopefully um, it'll be straightforward for you. OK. You have downloaded and installed RevMan. If you weren't able to download it because, for example, you had a university um, laptop, you'll have to email IT support and ask them to install it for you. Um, obviously, when you're on the um, the Cochrane page, you have to make sure that you're downloading the version that links correctly to your own um, machine. I think Macs are usually different to laptops and PC. 
Um, so I want to do an initial test run and we're going to use some real world data. And I picked a paper that we've already looked at in some detail in several early videos of this series, namely Zhang et al. from 2020, who, you remember, were comparing two approaches to keeping patients warm during elective abdominal surgery. Now, I've gone back to their paper and I found their data extraction table. This was the table that they created from their five primary studies uh, taken out and recording the key information. Notice that their key data temperature is recorded in degrees centigrade. Now we're lucky here because in all five papers cases, they all have the same units, so you don't have to do any conversion. If there were different units measuring the same thing, for example, um, we know that some places measure in degrees Fahrenheit, then you might have to do some converting. Um, a step you should always take um, is looking at this data extracted table and saying to yourself, what do I think? What do I feel about this data? And I'd invite you to pause the video at this point and just think about what you notice, what questions and points come to mind. Does all seem in order or does anything seem to stand out? Well, I noticed in only three out of the five studies where both, both groups had exactly the same uh, sample size. The other two were fairly close. Uh, but they may well have been initially identical, but then suffered from some subsequent dropout. Only the last paper, John et al., has what we might call a good sample size. But if all things are generally equal, um, then that's the whole point of a meta-analysis, namely to combine the results to generate a more accurate overall summary of the research question in mind. I also noticed that all but the last paper were from Japan, and I would definitely need to think about cultural comparisons in terms of their healthcare provision. For example, is Japan's health service like ours free for all or is it private? And finally, only one paper, John et al. again, managed to achieve statistical significance on its own terms, which is not that surprising, of course, again, given their large sample size. So just as a reminder, because we're going to try and mimic this, here is the forest plot from Zhang et al. that we have seen several times already. <coughs> and we are going to input the data to see if we can replicate what they found. Now, the only information we need extra is a sample size for each paper we have to, which we can take from the data extraction uh, table. And the rest we can take from any uh, information from the list of studies and the mean difference, etc. So what I've done is I've used their data extraction table just to jot down the key information that I will need to proceed. And you'll notice I've simplified very slightly the names of their paper. And we are now good to go. So let's open RevMan and input the data. OK, so we need to open up RevMan wherever you have it on your computer. Um, you can go down to the bottom left and uh, just type in RevMan, which is probably the quickest, or you can click on the little start menu here it's my little windows menu and just scroll down until i find my revman software so here it is actually i seem to have revman 5.3 that's fine so I'll click on that to open it you will notice that opening and editing data very often results in a lag and you're just going to have to get used to this um, because things can take a while. That might just be a feature of my own laptop, which is a little bit slow. Um, but if you see that, I suspect it'll be a, a, a common experience. Don't worry too much about it. OK, we have a welcome page that has uh, appeared on my first use of it. Um, I don't need that, so I'm just going to click on Close. So then I go into File and select New because I'm going to create a new database for a Revman, a new project. Um, it opens up the new review wizard um, and we just on this case just click simply click next. And now we need to choose our review type. Um, our intervention, uh, we're going to keep it as intervention review because we don't want to do any of these other ones like diagnostic testing accuracy or methodology, methodology review, etc. We are going to be doing an intervention review, so keep it as that. Click next. And I want to create a title. 
Um, now, it doesn't matter which one of these we choose because this isn't really part of any calculation, uh, but it's just for convenience. So I'm going to I'm going to type in carbon fiber polymer versus forced air warming. One, the health problem is for reducing hypothermia. OK, click next. And it's asking us, um, what are we going to be doing from here on in? Well, I'm going to be doing a full review. So I'll click full review. And then click finish. Then from here on, you'll see the title of your review in the top bar. Now we next want to enter the names and years of the studies, the data we're going to input uh, in, a, in a little while. Okay, on the left hand pane, what they call the tree view, I'm going to left click to expand the studies and reference section. Notice I'm clicking on that little plus sign. And then again, we're going to left click to expand where it says references to studies. Now that I've got that, I must right click on this first one called included studies and choose the first one, add a study. It's now waiting for some information. So name your first study for which you're going to input data. So here I'm going to put in uh, Hase Gawa. 2012 okay and by putting in the date after a space it will pick that up uh, automatically click next there are three pop-ups that come up now that we um, just leave as default um, keep where it says publish data only we now know the year because we put it in and finally just leave that one as is OK, for this uh, final field, it says, what do you want to do now? Well, I've got four more to add, so I want to add another study in the same section. Now I click continue and I put in my second study. OK, this next one is going to be John 2016. Click next, leave that alone. It's picked up the year automatically and leave that one alone. And again, add another study in the same section. OK, the next study is Matsusaki. And just to warn you, because some of these delays were more than a minute, I've actually trimmed out these waiting times in the video. So Matsuzaki, and that was 2003. Just mimicking what data we saw from Shang et al. Click Next, leave that one alone, picked up the right year and leave that one alone. Again, add another study. There's only two more to go. We now have Nagish, 2003. Next, 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 next. Add another study. Only one more to go. And the last one is Tanaka. 2013. Now, the order in which you put these in is not that important. I happen to put them in alphabetically. You could have put them in uh, chronologically or reverse chronologically. But in actual fact, it allows you later on to change the order uh, if if you so wish. So this last one's input. So we'll click next a couple of times. And now finally, because we've finished adding them in, uh, we'll leave that one that says nothing and just click on finish. So it takes us back to our home screen with the um, with the tree pane on the left hand side. If we click on included studies, if I just left click on that little uh, plus, we can now see all of our studies are listed here. And also you can start to see our studies lifted on this right hand pane as well. So we can just double check everything's all OK and in hand. OK, to input actual numerical results, as we must now do, we now click data and analysis on the left hand side, which is down here. Whoops, it's just going off the screen. Data analysis, I'm going to right click 
and select add comparison. So I'm now about to do my first meta analysis and I need to give it a name. Now many reviewers have several comparisons that they might be doing from their uh, wider research question. We only have one in this case, so I'm just going to put in carbon fibre versus FAW. Click next. What do I want to do? Well, I want to add an outcome under the new comparison. Click continue. Now, if we were going to study odds ratios, risk ratios, etc., we would choose dichotomous. And you'll notice it gives you a description in this inner pane as to what is meant. However, in our case, we are comparing the means, so we're going to choose continuous. Note the description box now tells us what we'll need to know, and that is the mean, the standard deviation, and the number of participants per group, which we already have to hand, remember, and then we click next. Now, I need to give my intended analysis a name. I know this seems like a bit of repetition and also give some explanatory labels to my two groups. So I'm just going to put here, which is better at preventing hypothermia. Carbon fiber. Or FAW. But I can't spell, let me just change that. And my group one, which is going to be my experimental group, I'm going to put in carbon fiber because I'm simply mapping, matching rather what they did with Zhang et al. And for the control group, I'm going to make it the FAW again, linking up with what Zhang did. Click next. Now, most of these we can leave as is. Um, as I am mimicking the Zhang study, I'm going to leave that fixed effect uh, model um, alone. But of course, in the data that we'll see later on, we will have to change this to the random effect. Also, you'll notice in this particular uh, box, not that we're going to change anything, this is where you could choose the standardized mean difference, which I mentioned back in video four, um, if my data measures were not on the same scale. Um, in others if they use different uh, units of measure but that's not the case here so we can leave well alone and we click next again <clears throat> and i will usually leave these uh default choices alone uh we do want the totals and subtotals in our plot uh, we're looking at the 95 percent confidence intervals for our primary papers and of course for the final um diamond the final pooled data as well uh, and 95 percent confidence interval as you know is the uh, is the more common choice Click next. <clears throat> OK, adjust these labels if I need to, where because we had the experimental um, arm labeled as the uh, carbon fiber, I put here lab, uh, favors carbon fiber for that first left graph label. That just means um, left of the line on the final forest plot. Um, and for the right graph label, I'm going to put favors FAW. The units, I may as well put them in because they are degrees centigrade. I'll just put deg cent. Um, scale 100% leave that as it is. I can change that. I think that, that is a scale to do with the visualization. We will be able to change that. And then it allows us to change the sort. It can change the sort by the study ID, uh, year of study, the weighting, etc. I'll just leave this as is for now. Okay, that, that study ID means that my results will initially appear in alphabetical order. Then click next again. Uh, leave this alone because um, we do need to edit, i.e. we do need in a moment to add data. And so click finish. So what it has now done is given us an empty table, which we can now enter actual results from our chosen studies. And you'll notice that the forest plot will appear on the very right hand side of this as we put data in. Now we can just click and type as we would do in say Excel, we have to find this little plus box here. So I click on that. And it says, OK, which uh, studies do you want to uh, use? Now, I want to select all of them. So I'm just going to click the first one, so select it, and then hold down the control key and select the remainder. And then click finish. So it knows that I'm ready for all of them. And finally, we are now in a position to input the data. You can see that all five studies have been selected. Um, and 
we can now put from our previous table that we made a note of, the values of the main standard deviations, etc. In the totals column, that's where we put the number of participants in each group. And notice that some of these boxes are white. Well, it's the white boxes are only those that we can and should edit. The remainder of the boxes will automatically become populated and updated as we enter the data. OK, this is the part we have to be very, very careful. Um, and this is actually, I had to do this a second time because the first time I kept making slight mistakes. So all five papers have to be input with the correct data. So the first paper was Hasegawa and the mean for group one is 36.0. The standard deviation is 0 0.6 and the sample size for that group one was 12. For the second group, the FAW group, the mean was 36.2, the standard deviation was 0 0.9 and the sample size again was 12. So, so far so good. I'm just double checking as I go along. For the second paper, John, group one has a mean of 35.9 the standard deviation of 0.6 and a much larger sample size of 82 in that group. For the FAW group, they have a mean of 36.1, standard deviation of 0.5 and a sample size of 78. And again, I'm just double checking with my table to hand that everything looks good. OK, on to paper three, Matsusaki. They have a mean for the first group of 36.7, a standard deviation 0.5. Group size 8, and for the second group, the FAW, they have a mean of 36.8, a standard deviation of 0.4, and a sample size of 8. The penultimate paper, Nagish, group 1 has a mean of 36.0, a sample size of 0.6, as of 8, and for group 2, a mean of 36.2. Standard deviation of 1.0 and a sample size of 8. And you can see as I add each of these in, the little chart on the right hand side, which I'm not actually focusing on, is starting to be populated, as are these weights on this um, the grey column to the right of my um, white cells. Final one, Tanaki, for group 1, a, weight, a mean of 36.2 a standard deviation of 0.4 and a group size which is relatively healthy of 33 and for group 2 36.3 is the mean 0.4 is the standard deviation and the group size is 33 okay all present and correct okay before i focus on the actual forest plot let's look a little bit about what's been produced you'll notice that this column the weight column um, that has now settled down and we can see that this gives an initial important uh, consideration as to how important each paper was. Um, and of course it has to add up to 100% and the weighting is calculated as a combination of the sample size and the standard deviation, um, sorry, and the 95% confidence interval in each case. Um, so the higher the weight, the higher the influence on the overall calculated measure. Uh, and of course, we can see very different weightings because the group sizes were themselves very different across all five. Um, I noticed here I didn't get quite the same agreement with the weightings and with one or two other values as we had in the published paper, but I suspect that they themselves input more decimal places perhaps for their values. OK, I've taken a break and come back to Revman and um, obviously I'm still learning this software um, as I go along, as it were. And uh, I've realized there's um, something which would help with the visualization, and that is that these columns can all be uh, expanded upon at the moment. We've got simply the default viewing with all my data in there and my very small um, forest plot on the right hand side here. What I'm just going to do here is just move my mouse until I see a double arrow and then just slide it across because I don't need all that uh, dead space. What that does then it, it makes the um, 
makes the confidence intervals all um, come into play and I can see them quite nicely and then I can just slide this one across as well just to make my um, forest plot um, visible. Now something else I can do as well is with this forest plot on the right hand side um, there's a little slider down the bottom uh, I think at the moment it was I think originally it was on 100% uh, 100 uh, scale something like this and what I've done there is I've used a slider just to zoom in and it's a very useful feature is that so we can now both look at our values on the left and simultaneously look at our forest plot um, so we can see quite clearly that um, all but one of the original five studies um, were not showing statistical significance John 2016 was the exception there um, and of course they all fairly well behaved because if you look at the actual measures they all pretty much lie in a straight line and that's an indication of good uh, levels of homogeneity in other words low levels of heterogeneity uh, which you can see here on the left hand side uh, one measure of heterogeneity i squared is comes out to be not percent so there's virtually no heterogeneity as calculated using this uh, test uh, we can see that the diamond it does not cross the zero line the line of uh, null hypothesis of no difference and you'd expect that because you'd expect that the diamond the pooled values to be at least better than the very best one and the very best one we had prior to the pooling was john and it would be a surprise if uh, we went from a statistical significance that we saw with john to one that wasn't statistical significant that is of course possible if the other papers show results that have a a uh, high level of heterogeneity, which this one doesn't have. Okay, so the pool data we get from this total value here. So the total value for the mean difference average across all five studies, taking into account weightings, is minus 0 0.15 with a confidence interval between minus 0 0.27 and minus 0 0.04. In other words, it overall favors the carbon fiber method of avoiding hypothermia it isn't a large effect at least visually in terms of numbers um, but remember that this is in degree centigrade and we know that when it comes to the human body uh, it has to it, the human body is uh, regulated to within a very narrow scale of temperatures so it is a statistically significant um, benefit um, we can see that once we pull the data that we have a sample size of 143 in the carbon fiber groupings uh, with fairly well matched number on the FAW groupings that um, small difference is of course reflected in the differences that we saw in the early studies which I hypothesize might have been due to unintended uh, dropout so we have our overall results and the values on the original papers all in one place along with the Forest plot as well. So the overall result is a 0.15 degree centigrade shift in body temperature in favor of the carbon fiber. And this means that overall the difference between these two approaches on average is only about one eighth of a degree. Now I'm not a healthcare worker, so whilst this doesn't sound a lot to me, I'm not really in a position to make a value judgment about this result. However, we can be assisted here by considering tests for overall effect given at the bottom, and that is where this value 2.54 comes in, this Z score, um, which does also reflect the p-value of 0.01, i.e. statistical significance. It's way less than 0.05. Uh, and we see that this, this, this Z score tells us how many standard deviation shift is there uh, in the magnitude, and we see it's more than two standard deviations. Um, so it's a shift in terms of the multiples of standard deviations, um, which is impressive in that sense, um, because you recall the standard deviation for any of the individual paper scores was only about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 um, for most of the measures. Now, as an aside, if you feel when you have done your qualitative uh, critical appraisal of the papers that there should be perhaps no rationale 
clear rationale evidence to do an overall pooling. Um, you can still make use of the forest plots, but what you don't want is the pooled um, result. So we can do that by simply clicking on the properties icon um, and just um, let me find where that is. So here, the top right is the properties icon. If I click on that um, and go to my graph, this is where you go to change things like the order of the studies. At the moment, I've got it ordered on study ID, which just means alphabetical, but I could have it ordered by year or weight or effect size. But what I can change here, if I go into yep, analysis detail, I beg your pardon. If I remove the totals and subtotal, just do subtotals only and click apply. Now you'll notice, even before I reveal, that what has happened is two things. The pooled line, the total line, has disappeared. So the diamond has disappeared. Also, <coughs> because we're not considering a systematic meta-analysis, uh, you'll notice that the weightings uh, part has disappeared. That column is now does have no population. Um, what you do still have is all of your... Um, just clear that up a little bit. You still have your confidence intervals for every study, but you'll also notice when you look at the forest plot, or rather what's left of the forest plot, you'll now notice that all the measures have a dot size, a, a small square size, the same size. They're no longer uh, change according to the um, uh, the weighting. If I go back, just so you can see that coming back into place, or back into the properties, back into analysis detail, reenact totals and subtotals, click apply and OK, and you'll see now that it all reverts back to as it were, which is um, which is reassuring. Also, uh, at this point, if you are doing an analysis where you're looking to see what effect any one particular study may have on the overall effect, you can do it, as it were, in a dynamic way, just by turning on and off these uh, values. If I, for example, remove um, one of the smaller papers, the Haz Hazugawa, you'll notice that by unticking that, that particular plot disappears and a recalculation is done for the whole thing. So weightings change and the, the final version. So with it turned on, we had um, minus 0.15. Haz Hazugawa turned off. I wonder if it's doing a calculation or not. It doesn't seem to be. Let's try another one. Because it seemed to... The weightings changed with the final score didn't. Let me pick the very big one, the John. Yep, it does change things. So it, it, the Hazegawa really had no influence on the final value. But the one, uh, if I turned off the most important one, John, which you recall was the only one statistical significance, it's um, it's had the result where now where our final pooled uh, result has no statistical significance. That's worth you thinking about when you're doing your own meta-analysis, your own systematic review, and certainly worth reporting on. Because if it turns out, for example, that a particular paper like here is dominating the final results, you've got to be absolutely sure that you are super confident that that particular paper um, was robust, had no suggestion of uh, biases in any direction because it can of course um, introduce that bias into the final results. Smaller studies don't carry that same uh, weighting. I'll have more to say about that in a in a moment um, but this would be a particularly good point to uh, to pause on here because what I want to do next is look at a, a study or two which does have um, some disagreements, some variation and therefore some heterogeneity uh, just to see if we can uh, push this particular part of the analysis a little bit further. OK, we'll pause it there. OK, as I need to show some different data, I thought, why not use actual data? And I want to show you a very useful feature of papers that are published via the Cochrane Library. So let's go to the Cochrane Library website. OK, I'll just type in Cochrane Library. And it's come up already because I've done this before. And just as a general example, to illustrate what I'm uh, going to be doing here, let's just search for, say, vitamin D. So in this search box, I'm going to type in 
vitamin D and then hit the search icon. Well, there's lots of opportunities, lots of systematic reviews. I'm just going to choose the top one, vitamin D for the management of asthma. So go ahead and click on that. This one is by Martino et al from 2016. Okay, we've got the paper in web form. We can download the PDF of the paper, but something very useful is available. The beauty of the Cochrane Library resource, and because I'm very lazy, is that this website allows you to not only download the full review, should you wish, as a say a PDF file, but also to actually download the data from that paper directly into RevMan. So let's consider how this works and we're going to um, use part of their data as an example. So on this right hand side you've got a, a pane that allows you to go to either certain parts of the data. In my case I'm just going to look at figures and tables before doing anything else. And I'll do this just in order to choose which particular uh, part of the uh, data I'm going to focus on later. So I've, I've looked at this before and I, I scroll down here, the figures and tables, etc. And I found analysis 1.10, 1.10. It was a comparison of vitamin D versus placebo for all studies. Um, and I thought, OK, that's a useful one because I looked at the spread of their various papers, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven papers, and felt that they looked like there was a bit of heterogeneity going on there. In fact, you can see on their figure the 65% heterogeneity. So I thought this would be a good paper for to, to do uh, at least the principles of a sensitivity analysis. Okay, you'll notice that they used a random effects model and that their measure wasn't a mean difference, but this time an odds ratio, which we've covered before. Had it been a mean difference, then the null hypothesis line would have gone through zero point on the axis below. But because this is a ratio, the odds ratio, the null hypothesis line goes through the number one. And you can see that they are spread left and right of this line. OK, so having chosen the test, uh, the analysis that I want to pick up on in a moment, I'm just going to close that window down. And then I'm on, again on this right hand side of the paper. I'm going to go down to where it says download statistical data. And by that, what it means is it's going to download directly to RevMan. Uh, there's a few terms and conditions, which I'm going to click OK to. It's essentially saying I'm using it not for commercial purposes. Download the data. And it's downloaded a file and it's already a RevMan file. So locate where that file is. Put it to somewhere that you uh, want to place it. So I'm just going to copy that and find my RevMan files. Um, in fact, it was the Cochrane files. I put it in too big. But I've already downloaded it there, as you can see. Um, so then I can now simply double click on that because RevMan is installed on my computer. So double clicking on a RevMan saved file will automatically open the RevMan software. Double click on that and we know that these things take a while. So I'll probably trim some elements of this out. OK, the view that we're looking at here is what is known as a text or review tab. Um, that automatically comes up once you open up a RevMan with existing data. I'm going to scroll down here uh, to the data and analysis section. So there's a lot of RevMan that we've not explored, but this was, after all, only an introductory video. Um, data and analysis section is where I'm after. Here we go, data analysis. And I was thinking about analysis 1.10, where well, it is, 1.10. Um, and they've done quite a bit of analysis with different papers, different subsets of papers. I've identified analysis 1.10 as worthy uh, of looking at just for the purpose of illustration here. And to open up that particular piece of analysis, we simply double click on this row. So I'll double click on there and it pulls up their forest plot and their data. We know how to tidy this up. Let me just make the screen a bit tidier. So make that a bit more visible. So if we want to, we can look at their data. Um, you'll notice it's an odds ratio they're looking at. So we've got their 95% confidence intervals here running down the right hand side. And we know that if it crosses either side of the one line, then it wasn't statistical significance. Um, and if it doesn't cross either side of the one line, that it does have statistical significance. We see one, two, three papers had statistical significance, but some papers ran to the 
right hand side of that one line so we weren't guaranteed to get statistical significance overall but we did um they had 499 versus 500 uh, participants in a vitamin D versus uh, placebo series of um, research articles. Um, they've given us that overall their level of I squared measuring their heterogeneity was 65%, which I think is at the medium level of hetero hetero heterogeneity. So this is what we want to now investigate. As well as tidying up the columns, if I want to, I can again, remember you have this slide that we can zoom in, zoom out uh, of the forest plot to get a, a better look. Now, according to Boland et al. 2017, a sensitivity analysis is where you include and exclude certain trials, certain papers from the analysis in order to further test and investigate the robustness of the overall results. Now, you don't just carry this out haphazardly, but you must be guided but by what has taken place prior, in your case, your own critical review summary, to investigate those papers that you feel may carry the greatest risk of bias. Now, there's a nice example of this in a video, which I'll link to at the end, where they focus on papers that they felt had the potential for selection bias. Uh, but as a simple example, just for the principle of sensitivity analysis, let's look at this Martino et al. paper from 2017 and further investigate their own analysis 1.10. Now, I didn't at this stage look into their own risk of bias review. You can look at that yourself. Uh, but I can see two papers here, namely Jensen 2016 and Martino 2015, uh, that have measured odds ratio which uh, lie above one, admittedly not statistically significant, and they seem to stand out against all the other papers that had, that had odds ratios falling below one. So I thought these might be worth looking at. So what I can do, and let's just make an odd, I'm going to write this down. Before I change anything, we have an I squared value of 65%, and we have an overall odds ratio of 0.53 with a lower range of 0.28 and upper range of 0.99. Okay, I've read a note of that pen and paper. Now let's untick Jensen and Martineau. Things have changed. The odds ratio has reduced from 0.53 down to 0.36, so it doesn't seem that it's as strong as a result. However, other elements have strengthened. Now we know we've removed artificially here papers that seem to disagree more strongly but look at the value of the heterogeneity it's gone from 65 percent down to 40 percent that's an improvement something else has occurred and that is the 95 percent confidence interval before was between 0.28 and 0.99 which is a 0.71 range has now changed to 0.20 going up to 0.67, which is only a 0.47 range, which has reduced the range of the confidence interval. So already you can see just by having your data loaded in and starting to think about uh, how certain papers are interacting, contributing, as it were, towards a final total, it's a really useful thing to be able to do. And so sensitivity analysis, broadly speaking, looks at what is happening with heterogeneity, what is happening with variation in results, uh, variation in um, robustness of the papers. Now, clearly, any sensitivity analysis that you carry out must be carried out with a clear rationale and the results must be tracked and reported on. So don't just use it to fiddle around with your data of selected papers because all you'll be doing then is introducing your own observer bias in order to cherry pick those papers which happen to give the best results that is not good research okay let's go back to the ta text of uh, review tab so i'm just going to close this window oops sorry i'm just going to click rather on this text of review tab and scroll down a bit further and we can see that actually they did carry out a sensitivity analysis uh, uh, on, on two occasions um, and you can see that they themselves uh, looked at uh, different outcomes and I'll leave that to you to you to look at their original paper if you so wish to see uh, how they came to that decision uh, and what um, conclusions they're able to draw from it. Okay finally one other way in which your set of selected papers can be further explored is by what is known as a subgroup analysis. This is different to a sensitivity analysis but it has similar 
uh, changes that you can see to your data. Now, this might be carried out if the data within which selects the selected papers have, uh, have declared groupings that you wish to further investigate, e.g. they may have data separated out for males versus females, and then you want to investigate how they may be contributing to the results or to the overall heter heterogeneity. Now, obviously, you can only do this if the data from your primary papers has the separated out values for these subgroupings. You can't create that yourself with data you don't have access to. Of course, there's nothing stopping you contacting the primary authors for that research uh, to see if you can get uh, the original data as well. Now, the subgroup analysis is illustrated very nicely in an excellent four-minute video by Dr. Stephen Bradburn, who is a senior medical writer from the Manchester Met University. So I'm going to give you the link at the end of this presentation, uh, and you can decide if you think if it applies to your own systematic review, you can check that out. Now, I'm going to leave it with you from here on in to explore further aspects of RevMan, such as using fixed effects versus random effects, using standardized mean difference rather than just the mean difference. In other words, your learning has only just started. I cannot give you all answers to all possible questions. And at the end of the day, your own systematic review will only track down one particular avenue. So I wanted to keep this video to some sort of uh, control. Well, this completes this introduction to the use of RevMan, but I hope it has emboldened you to realize that it is certainly a doable exercise and that by having access to such a wide variety of high quality systematic reviews, such as those offered by the Cochrane Library, that you feel you can now be guided at each stage to see how your own research question uh, is answered using this approach. <clears throat> so to summarize, in this video, We've learned how to find and install RevMan, and then how to input the data from those papers that will form our own systematic review. Once the data was put in, we could then fairly easily carry out a meta-analysis and obtain both a tabulation of this pooling of data as well as a forest plot. We reminded ourselves what the components of this output was telling us, and we went one small step further by looking at how a sensitivity analysis might proceed in order to investigate how certain papers that might be designated as problematic were influencing the final outcome, including such results as the level of heterogeneity. I showed you a neat little feature of the Cochrane Library website that allows you to download data from published systematic reviews directly into RevMan in order to explore on your own terms the works of others in areas that may be of interest to you. So although this final video has only been an introduction to the use of RevMan, I hope it has given you the confidence to take and develop your own understanding and experience further, and I wish you the best of luck in your own research. And that's the end, the actual end. If you've made it all the way through these five videos, then I'm really impressed. But if not, do think about going back to certain videos or parts of the videos as you need them in order to help with your own dissertation work. But I do hope overall they've been of some help and have started out to at least demystify what systematic reviews are all about. And here are the references, as usual. And here are those key resources mentioned throughout this last video. The second one down is the short three minute video produced by one of the Cochrane Review principal editors. And the final one listed above is the four minute video produced by Dr. Stephen Bradburn that I mentioned earlier. And along with my usual disclaimer for the images used in this presentation. So for one last time, do take care and cheerio.